before the board today is the State of Ohio versus Morgan. And uh, I apologize. I think it's allergies, so, but you might hear me clear my throat a little bit. <laughs> anyway, you each will have 15 minutes to present your arguments. And uh, you may reserve up to five minutes as the appellant. And you both, because not working today, get oh, the water started. That's okay. Mm -hmm. May it please the court, I am prepared to see, proceed. Uh, my name is Attorney Wesley Buchanan. I represent Tyler Morgan in this matter. He's the appellant. I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal, please. Thank you. Tyler's issues uh, come and stem from the trial court's timeline of this case. Uh, in the meantime, we had a law passed, which then creates a new duty on Tyler, which was to register. Uh, as the record indicates, Tyler pled no contest on February 4th, 2019. Sierra's law took effect on March 20th, 2019, and then on May 7th, 2019, uh, Tyler moved to withdraw his plea. Now, he pled no contest, so that just preserved uh, his rights for this court to review what the trial court did. Uh, the problem there with the trial court's issue is that the trial court only had one sentence to give in this case, and that was life imprisonment with a parole eligibility in 15 years. So the PSI, did not really impact this sentence. Uh, whatever the prosecutor at the time would have said and whatever trial counsel would have said, or allocution for that matter, and as I believe from the trial transcripts, I believe the victims were notified of the plea, uh, but I will confirm that in the transcripts. So even Marcy's law was adhered to for his plea. And the concern that you have is that you have a plea where only one sentence can be given, and then the trial court waits. The trial court orders a PSI, uh, and, and in fact, statements and all those kinds of things, then they have a sentencing hearing, and in that meantime, the General Assembly passes Sierra's law, which does require now Tyler to have to register in the Violent Offender Database, the VOD. Now, at Tyler's plea, there is no mention of those registration requirements in the transcripts whatsoever. In addition, the trial court does confirm that the set, and Tyler does tell this, the court, quote, uh, the play, uh, transcript at page nine of his plea, that he, quote, understood that the sentence is what it is. So at that time, the trial court does not notify Tyler of the his violent offender database registry requirements. At sentencing, the law is passed. He is now going to be convicted because the VOD registration requires the person to be pled guilty or uh, convicted. So he is then sentenced to apply and register, which requires his 10-year registry. Uh, Counsel, can I stop you just for sure. a second? Okay, if I want to make sure I understand the timeline, and I think I do, but so whenever he actually pled no contest, the trial court um, obviously went through the, the uh, criminal eleven, you know, colloquy. But your your one of your complaints is that the trial court did not advise him of the necessity of registering. With, Cor correct. Ahead. Okay, but at that point in time, it wasn't the law, right? Correct. Okay. And. So, I mean, I understand your argument, I think, with the sentencing aspect of it and the delay and everything, but we can't really fault the trial court for something that wasn't in the law at that point. You can fault the trial court for not sentencing immediately as pursuant to the criminal rules because in this situation, there was only one sentence to give. I can understand if this was uh, subject to indeterminate sentencing, which is uh, a life sentence is tends to be indeterminate, or there was a... Uh, an agreed sentence or some other situation, but the trial court at this time had to issue one sentence, and that was the life imprisonment with 15 years. Did anybody request the PSI? The court did. I don't tell. The court did, correct, and that's what the, is in the transcripts. The defense count, uh, Tyler did not, and I don't believe the state of Ohio, the government did not. Uh, and that's so are you asserting he didn't make a knowing, intelligent, voluntary plea because he wasn't advised of the registration? Correct. 
that is one of your assignments there. It is, Your Honor. It is one of the assignments there. That's why he and he did move to withdraw his plea after the law took effect, and then he was uh, informed of these requirements. Uh, the second, uh, this goes to I believe it's, that's his fifth assignment there. I as see that. Yes. As far as the uh, insufficiency and manifest weight arguments go, uh, in this case uh, there were uh, two candidates, uh, Tyler and another candidate, for being the shooter in this situation. And as a plea of no contest, the government is required to put a certain set of facts on the record to permit the court, which is required to, pursuant to the criminal rules, to find Tyler guilty. In this situation, in the record, the uh, government put on that there were two people and both shot into the car. Now, Tyler was convicted of uh, Ohio's felony murder rule, felony murder statute, which, which if the death occurred within the commission of a felony, that would make him convicted. Uh, and that would give sufficient evidence here. There was no causation in the facts and circumstances of uh, the presentation of facts and circumstances in this case, uh, because there were two people um, that were nominated to be the shooter here. Uh, so I'd indicate to the court that an essential element of Ohio's felony murder rule is that you have to show causation, and the government has to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, the evidence, um, or there were no facts and circumstances other than the shooter both people shot into a car. Um, it sounds like you're not saying causation. You're saying who you're you're actually arguing that the state had to demonstrate who was the actual shooter that sh that caused the death. Not we all. I mean, nobody's disputing that it was a homicide. Correct. You know, and that he died from a bullet wound. Correct. Okay. So you have a causation element and an identification element. But with the Ohio, so with the felony murder statute, all the government has to prove is that. Tyler committed a fel was in the process of committing a felony, i.e. felonious assault, more than likely in this case with uh, shooting uh, into a car, and then a death occurred as a result of that. So it, it, there, there is an identification issue and a causation issue here. So that goes to the, his, uh, Tyler's manifest weight and uh, sufficiency arguments. And again, the government was on notice that they had to do that. Um, as far as touching briefly on Tyler's separation of powers argument, uh, revised Code 290343-D2 permits the prosecutor to file a motion to extend the 10-year enrollment period, which, as the case law suggests, the prosecutor is part of the executive branch. So what that permits the uh, executive branch to do is review the judicial opinion. Uh, so the prosecutor can say, I didn't like this opinion, we need to enroll them longer. Now, it does put requirements on the prosecutor, but at the core, it's giving the prosecutor, the executive branch, a portion to say, listen, I can now review a judicial branch opinion. Uh, and that's I, Tyler's complaint there is a separation of powers. I don't believe that was raised at the trial court level, so I believe that's on a plain air standard here as far as the court is concerned. Um, as far as uh, Tyler's unconstitutional issues, again, revised code section 1.58, that's where the uh, vested right is, and Tyler would submit that because there was only one sentence to give here, that the, these registration requirements should not be applied to him as far as uh, the violent offender database. Because this is a, a liking to the arson registry and the sex offender registry where it does create a burden on him and it does create a uh, criminal offense. Uh, and this criminal offense did not occur until March 20th, 2019. Now, whether or not, what we, I'm not going to speculate as to what the trial court knew or any of the parties knew at any period of time, but pursuant to criminal rule 11, he had a right to understand his registration requirements because how could his plea be knowingly if all of a sudden I make a plea of no contest and then later on before I'm sentenced, the court says, okay, oh, by the way, you've got to register in this database uh, because that should have gone into the calculus because I believe in a plea for a sex offense or an arson offense, that part of the plea has to go notifying of the registration requirements, and I believe is in that statute. Are you arguing that the registration is punitive then? <laughs> in this case, yes. Uh, in this case, yes, because of the timeline of where we are. So this is an as-applied constitutional argument instead of a facial constitutional argument, because as-applied to Tyler, it is unconstitutional. Because of the timeline we find himself in, uh, because of his timeline of the plea and his sentencing. Is there a requirement that the court permit victim impact statements before sentencing? Before sentencing? Uh, no, I believe Marcy's law requires the victim be notified of each stage and each hearing of the process. Mm -hmm. 
And I believe that pursuant to the docket, um, because there was a written plea of no contest here, um, that people were notified that this was going to be a plea day. And I, I want to double check to be absolutely sure, but I think there's a reference in the plea colloquy that there were vi uh, members of the victim's family there. Was there any indication that it would also be a plea and sentencing on that day? I do not believe so. Um, I do not believe there was any indication, but that goes to the point that the court could only give Tyler one sentence here. And that's kind of the situation that Tyler finds himself in because 30, criminal rule 32A requires the trial court to sentence, sentence shall be imposed without unnecessary delay. Um, now, courts work on their own timelines and dockets are up in their courts, and that's certainly a, a position here that we have to find ourselves in. But for a 18-year-old person to come into a court and plead no contest, knowing that he's going to be found guilty of murder and knowing what the sentence is, and then all of a sudden, now having additional requirements poses an issue for the trial court. The trial court could have corrected this matter by permitting Tyler to withdraw his plea um, or doing a, a re-plea colloquy because sentence had not occurred. So he filed a motion to withdraw a sentence pursuant to 32A, um, or 1, excuse me. Uh, and so the court trial court did deny that motion to withdraw his uh, plea, excuse me. So I wanted to make sure that that is there. And I would indicate, at least for the record, that um, revised code 290342C, B and C, is the um, violent offender database registry. And those do require uh, notices to be provided to Taylor, to, excuse me, to Tyler. Um, it says... Counsel, I want to okay. stop you for a second. Sure. You are into your five minutes. It's up to you, though, if you want to continue. I will reserve the rest of it for rebuttal. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court, I'm Jacqueline at Corbin on behalf of the state, which is the appellee in this case. And a couple of, of points I'd like to address. Um, first of all, I, I'm going to explain why the, the violent offender registry is not a penalty. And, and that, I think, will, will logically explain why the rest of the assignments of error raised in this case are, are meritless. Contrary to counsel's argument, this cannot be a, an as-applied challenge to the Violent Offender Registry Law. The fact that it applies to, to this defendant does not mean, does not give rise to an as-applied challenge. The, an as-applied challenge would actually be assignment of error number two, where he's arguing that, that he did not meet the criteria to be considered a violent offender to fall under the registry statutes, and his argument that, that he had rebutted the presumption that is created by the statute. That would be an as-applied challenge. Instead, what he raises by claiming it's an ex post facto law and that it's punitive, that is a facial challenge to the constitutionality of the statute. And to do that, he bore the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that there are no conceivable sets of circumstances where the statute would be constitutional. That's a high and heavy burden for him to meet, and he has not done so. Instead, what we're looking at under Ohio, for Ohio's standards, I, I will pause here and say that there are two possible provisions that, could, that deal with the retroactivity of statutes. There's the ex post facto clause from the US Constitution. That was not actually argued in this case. Instead, what we're falling under is Ohio's, which is Article 2, Section 28. Um, and that's a two-part test to determine whether a statute is impermissibly retrospective. First of all, you have to look at whether it, the, the law is actually expressly retrospective. And I will admit that, that when, when the state of Ohio argued this below, we did concede it, it, that it is a retrospective statute. We cited the wrong portion of the statute, however. The portion that you need to look at is um, 2903.04a2, which says that once a person who on or after the effective date of the statute has been convicted of or pleaded guilty to a qualifying offense and is 
in a jail serving any kind of other term of confinement for the offense, which arguably could be somebody like the defendant in this case who's in jail awaiting sentencing, then, then that statute applies to that person. And also, once a person has been convicted, regardless of when they have been convicted of a violent offense that falls under this statute, even if it were 10 years ago, the statute applies to them. So we, we admit, we can see that this statute is specifically retrospective in its operation. However, even if the statute is retrospective, then this court has to go further and look at the second part of the test, and that's to determine whether it's a remedial statute or whether it's substantive or, or essentially punitive. The state argues that this is not a punitive statute for several reasons. It really does not implicate Mr. Morgan's substantial rights. It doesn't take away or impair his vested rights. Um, it does not involve any kind of affirmative disability or restraint, as does the Adam Walsh Act, for instance, for sex offender registration. And unlike, or, or this statute is actually closer to the arson registry statute, which the Supreme Court of Ohio has held is not punitive. Also, this is not, the registration has not been historically re, um, regarded as any kind of punishment. And this, this does not even, it's not even applied after a finding of scienter. In other words, if Mr. Morgan in the future were to fail to register, there's no, there's no requirement that he be found to have purposely not registered. Doesn't it impose an additional burden on uh, a defendant for, in this case, past acts? Actually, under the, under the precedent of um, State versus Caldwell, which we've cited in, in the brief, and under um, State versus Cook, which had approved the Megan's Law registration for sex offenders, um, just the fact of registration will no. It does not impose an additional burden. Because not all collateral consequences of a conviction are necessarily a penalty. But where, for instance, the Adam Walsh Act has been held to be a penalty is because it requires registration, for instance, every 90 days for the rest of a person's life. It imposes restrictions on where a person can live. You know, you have, have requirements that you can't live within a certain distance from a school or, or a church, for instance. So those kinds of restrictions elevate the Adam Walsh Act um, registration and that kind of sex offender registration to an actual penalty versus, for instance, the arson registration. Keeping in mind that when we have the violent offender registry, they, yeah, a person has to register annually with, in person with the Sheriff's Department for 10 years. Okay, contrary to counsel's arguments, that can't be actually extended by any will of anybody in the executive branch of government, um, namely the prosecutor's office. It's actually extended by the court, per the plain language of the statute, only if the offender is, ends up being found guilty of a community control violation or a new violent offense. So the extension is not up to the, up to the executive branch, it's up to the actual offender and, as approved by the court. And the registration, unlike the Adam Walsh Act, doesn't continue for life. It expires at the end of the registry term. And, and the level of the offense that the person can be charged with for failure to register is a, is a fifth degree felony or a violation of their existing community control. It's not like the Adam Walsh Act where they wind up being charged with the same offense level as the offense for which they were previously convicted. For instance, if they were, if they were convicted of a first degree felony rape, failure to register becomes a first degree felony. This isn't the case. It's, it is a felony, but it is a low level fel felony that does not bear the presumption of prison as, as a sanction. 
So, therefore, there really is no meritorious separation of powers argument. And because this, this statute is only remedial <coughs> like the arson registry and is not punitive in its operation, then because it's not punitive, the court was under no duty to notify Mr. Morgan of its application. Remember, there are people who are currently in prison who have been in prison for 10 years, and upon their release, according to the statute, the Department of Rehab and Corrections has to notify them of their duty to register. So this isn't something that, like post-release control, where it's an additional sanction. It is merely a collateral consequence and is not punitive. Just like it is, an it is a collateral consequence that that some felons are not permitted to, for instance, live in public housing. And they also can't have certain licenses from the state. It's not a punishment, it is merely a collateral consequence. And so for that, the court was not required as part of the Rule 11 colloquy to notify Mr. Morgan of that. That's in addition to the fact that even though the law had, had been passed by the legislature prior to Mr. Morgan's plea, it was not effective until the month after the plea, until the end of the month after the plea. And as far as, as counsel's argument that the court had one sentence to give and was under a duty to sentence Mr. Morgan immediately that day, there was a question raised. I there was, because you said that that law wasn't passed until a month after sentencing. But what you said prior to that was there are people sitting in prison now that are on there for 10 years due to come out and then the, the parole board's going to have to impose that. That's, well, that's that. correct, Your Honor. So is it your argument then that even if he wasn't told of this today, 10 years from now when he gets out, 15 years from now, he's going to be advising the same thing? Exactly. Yes, Your Honor, that is the case. So even if he had been sentenced immediately, he would still fall under its provisions once it went into effect because it is specifically retrospective in its, in its operation. Plus, uh, and I lost my, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I just was like, wait a minute. Well, you're, you were talking about the court's duty to sentence because of, there's immediately because of the uh, mandatory sentence. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, there was a question about whether Marcy's law might apply to require a victim impact statement. And, and Judge Schaefer, I think that was either your question or Judge Carr's question. And currently, um, yes, even though we don't have enabling legislation yet to, to enact all the provisions of Marcy's law and put it in particular terms in the revised code, the Ohio, um, we, we do have the amendment to the Ohio Constitution that does give victims not only the right to be present and to be notified when a sentencing occurs, but they also have the right to be heard. And so under Marcy's law, under that provision of the Ohio Constitution, the survivors of the victim in this case had a constitutional right to be heard at sentencing, even though, as counsel argues, there was only one sentence to give. Is that the reason the court gave for continuing the sentencing? Not explicit, Your Honor, but explicitly, Your Honor, no. The court said, I want a pre-sentence investigation. I would also inform the court that not all of the quote-unquote blame for the delay in sentencing is attributable to the delay in completing the pre-sentence investigation. Mr. Morgan also at least once refused to come to court for sentencing. And so at least part of the, of the quote-unquote blame for the delay falls also on him. So this is not specifically um, all the, the courts all the courts fault as, as counsel would put it. As I just want to briefly touch on the sufficiency and manifest weight arguments, I would remind the court that under our current precedents, neither one of these assignments of error is cognizable concerning a, a no contest plea unless what the prosecution says during that hearing is contrary to what the facts that are included in the indictment. There was never any challenge to the sufficiency of this indictment. 
and, and nothing that the, that the prosecutor said to add to that the recitations of the indictment contradicted any term of the indictment. Therefore, neither one of those assignments of error is cognizable in this case. Counsel, I, I don't know if you're going to get to this. You only have about a, a little less than two minutes. But I wanted to ask a question about the last assignment of error regarding the motion to suppress. And I was a little confused in reading the briefs as to when actually the picture went on the uh, police department's Facebook. I can clarify that. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, what happened was that the driver of the car were the, in which the victim was riding, he knew both of the defendants in this case, both of the co-defendants. And the day after the, the shooting occurred, he did go to police and said, you know, gave the circumstances of why they were there. And he identified both of the co-defendants. And then after that, the police department got the photograph and put it on the Facebook page. So we had the driver of the car identifying the defendants to the police. Then the police used to be the, a database of public school children um, in Ohio, found the defendant, um, found the date of birth, was able then to find, using that information, the driver's license photograph showed it to the driver of the car, said, is this the same person you're, you're talking about? That person said yes, and then it was at that point that the police department put the photo on Facebook. Okay, so <clears throat> then the record is going to reflect that the night of the shooting, his face was, I mean, his picture was not on Facebook. That's what the officer testified to. And Judge Schaefer, you look like you had a question pending. So um, unless there are any other further questions from the court, um, the state of Ohio would rest for the remainder of its arguments on the briefs and urge this court to affirm. Thank you very much. Code section 2903-43D2. The 10 year enrollment period may be extended, but only if the prosecutor files a motion with the Court of Common Pleas of the county in which the violent offender resides or in which the qualifying out of state offender resides. It then goes on to say that the court shall issue an order that extends the VOD duties of the violent offender or qualifying out of state violent offender indefinitely, and the offender's VOD duties shall continue indefinitely right there in the statute, Your Honor, um, and that gives the only person that can extend this indefinitely would be only if the prosecutor files a motion. That means the court can't do it. So that's a clear violation of the separation of powers. As far as the uh, registration requirements, when the court held a hearing, when listening to Tyler to try and rebut the presumption, uh, the evidence presented at that hearing was that not that he was, he, Tyler was not the principal offender in this matter. That's part of the statute that the uh, court was trying to take into consideration. Um, I think the court did issue finding the fact and conclusions of law in their logic in the journal entry that deemed Tyler a uh, violent offender and required him to register in that case. Um, and so in that regards, we'd like to have the court taken a place. As far as the low-level felony, at least currently in uh, Summit County, uh, this would not be, if Tyler were to be out, not register, subject to a fifth degree felony, he's not TCAP eligible, and he could suffer prison. TCAP is a sentencing guideline that this court is well familiar with, so prison is on the table. Very much so. Um, so there, this is a punitive, at least to Tyler, it is a very punitive in measure. Um, and he did have a vested right uh, pursuant to, like I said, Revised Code 148 and 158 and Black's Law Dictionary because he didn't have to register. Uh, and even if he were ha have to register after he got out, he would at least have the ability to challenge it. I guess that was my question. So if, if in fact, once he gets out in 15 years, he has to register because after the law says that the probation is not to go put it on, then when? Challenge them. He should have. He, he has the right to challenge it uh, immediately as it becomes applicable to him. So, uh, if he was released after 15 years and paroled uh, by the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation Corrections, then he should have the ability to uh, complain and at least bring it back to the court and say, "Listen, 
you didn't tell me about this 15 years ago. This is a new registration requirement. I, I should not be subject to it. Currently, the statute doesn't permit either the court to adhere to that kind of thing. It has no jurisdiction even to entertain that because it only gives the prosecutor the ability to file a motion. So even if Tyler were to file a motion, the court could say, no jurisdiction here, the statute doesn't permit it. And I think that's contrary to what the ability for someone to challenge a requirement is placed upon them for registration. How is um, the uh, appellant here different than anyone at the prosecutor saying it's in prison uh, presently that will have to go through the same procedure upon release? Tyler had the unfortunate position of being in the wrong place at the wrong time when the law was passed. Uh, truly and honestly, that's to answer the question. He's just at the wrong place at the wrong time for when the General Assembly passed the law. It, and he has the ability to raise it now instead of having to wait 15 years and be incarcerated for that day-for-day -day period of time before the parole office even determines whether or not if he's eligible. Because the, given his sentence of 15 years to life, there's no guarantee he gets out of 15 years. Uh, so he is different in that regard, it's just the fact that he well, did leave. If he was convicted two years earlier, wouldn't he still be under the, upon his release in 15 years? And then he should have the ability to challenge it upon his release. Okay. You're Perfect. saying the timing of it. I'm saying that Tyler is just a victim of circumstance in the sense that the, he makes a plea of no contest, the law had been passed at that time but had not taken effect, and then the law takes effect, and then he is sentenced with this enhanced penalty. So in other words, um, somebody that's in prison right now, it may not be something that they can raise because it hasn't affected them, so it's premature. Correct. I would say that nothing, it, it, it has not been vested as far as that is concerned. Here, Tyler has a vested right because it is applicable to him, and the court definitely told him in sentencing that these are your requirements, and that's why he's challenging it now. And if the court does not have any other further Further question. Tyler would respectfully ask this court to. Uh, counsel. Quick question. Is there a case law that says the, uh, that, that he does have a vested right in registration? There is no case law as far as the VOD is concerned, Your Honor, because as far as I'm, I could find, this was the first case that we were that was coming up on a challenge in the Ohio Supreme Court. This court has not made, at least to my research abilities, has been able to issue an opinion. So I use Black's Law Dictionary and the current case law to analogize to where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as counsel know, we will take the matter under advisement and we will issue a written opinion that will be sent to both sides, as well as we will release it on our website, the Supreme Court website. So I appreciate your arguments, we appreciate your arguments, and um, we'll take it under advisement. Thank you.